John, good to see you, buddy. Hey, how are you? I'm pretty good. Um, at this point in your career, just because I was just reading an article about a, a chart issue from the 70s, but are you genuinely still interested in music, or are you so... Has music weathered you to the point of, to you know, maybe you don't, you not your interest has waned because you live it. I, you know what, I, I'll answer like this. I went to L.A. a couple years ago for the Grammys, and I was so interested in going behind the scenes and seeing like Universal Studios, and I wanted to see like where the movies were made and stuff like that. So my wife and I went, and I was about an hour in. I was like, I hate this. I don't want to know the behind the scenes of why I love these movies so much and why I'm like so infatuated with yeah. all these movies. But like in music, it's different because it's therapy for me. I'm, I'm still, I'm in love with like the high that I get. I'm not like into any other highs except for writing songs. And like the day that we write a great song, I'm like, oh my God, that'll sustain me for a while. Really? So you... Yeah, I still love it. That's, Although, a, that's awesome to hear. I, at times... Okay, let me switch it up then. But I don't feel- love everything that I hear. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not even asking that. <laughs> you know but what I'm saying? Do you ever go, dang, I just wish I could do like a, a rock project, like write on some rock records or oh, like write on some some uh, comedy stuff or hip hop track or just something because you flex the same, not the, you flex a series of the same muscles. Every day. Every, thousands right. of songs about the same kind of 20 subjects. Yeah. I mean, I, I can do that because I'm a shadow. I'm not the face I, i'm kind of like an enigma we get, we get to do whatever we want as writers we're kind of lucky in that we can change our personalities musically every day i, I went to la a couple of weeks ago and wrote with ryan to like ryan tedder studio a buddy of mine writes for him we all kind of went out there and hung and wrote just crazy stuff was like, that refreshing to you when you say crazy stuff as oh yeah it was like a breath of just like mm. almost like the the way i fell in love with country music like living in amarillo texas everywhere you, you you're just in it you're breathing it everywhere you go when I would go to L.A., I felt that newness and, like, the love of it. Like, I was listening to George Strait and all that stuff way back when I fell in love with what I do. But there was just, like, the novelty of writing crazy stuff that there's no box. There's no real. You can say whatever you want. There's no bleeping. There's just whatever the truest emotion you can possibly put in a song, go for it. Oh, also make it, like, as, like as catchy as you possibly can. So I was very, very much like, God, this is an amazing situation. And we wrote like six, seven songs, and three of them are already cut. So, that quick. Yeah, and it was weird. For me, that has been doing sports. I, I I did sports a lot when I was younger. I did a national Fox Sports show. I covered the draft for ESPN. But for so long, I just you know I'd been doing this morning show, and you know we play a few songs a morning, but still it's the same series of muscles for the most part. And you do it five days a week, five hours a day. And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to get back into sports. Now, I still do the show and love doing my show. And I love when it's a good, and I'm oh, on, yeah. and it feels great. Like you said about writing a song, it's the most fulfillment I get. However, doing the sports show has been that. Yeah, it's fun. Where it actually makes me better doing the OG thing because I remember, oh, this is what it feels like for it to like be super fresh and why I love doing what I do every single day. When you take a trip to L.A. or you write something, does that remind you of how, even though you do it all the time, oh, yeah, I forgot. It is really awesome. I yeah. freaking get to do this all the time. It, you come back with, like, that's the magic. That I got to find the magic back in this. And music changed. Even, like, the last couple of years, it changed so much from, like, you know, I went through, like, the crazy, you know, um, where everything was, like, truck girl broke up, you know, the bro, bro country thing. I, like, came up with that. And I'm not, I mean, I'm from rural Texas on a ranch in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, that's not really what I grew up as. You know, my dad's a preacher. That wasn't my life. But it, I was able to, like, get into that and then change through this this whole next phase. And I'm still, like, amazed that, you know, I'm even here doing this craziness. But, are you, though, amazed? Or yeah. are you amazed that it's still being done the same-ish way? I, f- I, I understand your sentiment because I'm like, Okay, this is crazy. I'm amazed. I get to do this show for 200 cities, and I just grew up a poor kid in Arkansas. And I get to make all this money now. And but then <laughs> yeah. it's, you know what? I've worked really hard. I've worked really strategic. I have taken big risks. I have figured it. So I'm amazed, but I'm also like, yeah, this is what happens when 
hard work, a little bit of being fortunate, a little bit of being around the right people come together. Yeah, and I think me and you both have done something that is hard to do and continue to do. It's like I write songs that I think are like my life as mm-hmm. as much as I possibly can. You, Your show is your life, and you guys like are way too open, and like there's a big diary of the last 20 years of you online and everything it's it's amazing but it also makes us like we're listening every morning we're like we're not as alone when i write a song i want to write something that's real like where i feel the same for, way yeah, yeah where it's like I wanna, oh I, I felt that yes like that's a good song to me whenever i go that person's speaking for me and they don't even know they're speaking for me yes like if i if i have i've messed up a lot of my life like big and small and like all different ways but I'm putting them in in the songs, you know, and like that's the only ones that ever make it through. All these other formulas, uh, you know, with the exception of like some are fun and they'll make it, but most of the time it's the real stuff that I'm living with my buddies, or you know, all of us are just kind of like puking on the page and bleeding right there on in the lines of the songs, and that's what makes it cool to me when I'm listening. And yeah, maybe that's why pop is going through a similar thing in that vein where i'm like oh these are like sound like real things that are happening to these people and and pop's going through that vein too where it's very descriptive like overly descriptive yeah and almost to a funny mm -hmm. (laughs) like the color of the brand of tennis shoe on the exact street corner that they got it on a tuesday and that's fit into the lyrics and it's like oh wow well that was clunky but now it's so honest yeah that's now i like it it doesn't feel made up because it's like too Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost too fake to be made up. It's got to be real. There's got to be re- real stuff in there. I asked about the, the music part, but when I walked in, because I was, again, this article I was reading was about artists who, and I do find myself being genuinely, I still just love the history of music more than I do the current of music, because I live in the current. I got current coming at me every day, yeah. all directions. And maybe 10 years, I'll like this, I'll, I'll appreciate this more yeah. of now. But um, I love the history of music. And I was reading this article about these artists who only got to number two on the billboard chart but they had written number ones for other people and the the billboard chart is is a different monster than the country chart where the country chart they almost it's too i'm not gonna say easy but they give away too many ribbons i feel i got in trouble for saying that big time big time i was like because these record labels talk to each other and they decide who's going to get the one here who's going to get the one there and some of the songs should be number one for a lot longer than that. Yeah. And some shouldn't even crack the top ten. So it's I got crazy. I got in a bunch of trouble. <laughs> it is what it is. It's behind the Oz's curtain. You're just like, yeah. whoa, wait, wait. I'm seeing stuff. And they got, everybody got pissed. It was a. <laughs> it wasn't great. Anyway, so uh, for example, Bruce Springsteen. I did not know that on his first album, and I wasn't a big. I'm not a big Bruce Springsteen guy, and that makes me not cool because I know Bruce people like Bruce. I like the hits, but he wrote "Blinded by the Light." Wrapped up yeah. like, and the guy who I and when he put it out, it was not a hit. But like Manfred Mann's Earth Band put it out, it went to number one, <laughs> and crazy. he ever only got to number two on the chart. Bruce Springsteen, that's unbelievable. Never got to number one, which to me is also crazy. There was another Bob Dylan did it twice, and the only song that he ever had get to number one was one he wrote. And so I'm read, I'm I'm kind of jogging through this article and i'm just like wow this is so cool this is so amazing and i i catch myself sometimes going man i'm still really into music this is super cool yeah and i love those moments where i go oh yeah yeah yeah, i still love music because oh, yeah. a lot of times i don't well I've, I've i've gone through seasons where i just the grind of this whole thing is is you know you write thousands of songs and three become hits but i was reminded i was with uh, uh edwin mccain a couple weeks ago, we, we opened up. I love a, that dude. Dude, amazing. I love that dude. Yeah. I, I was with him and we opened for Old Dominion. Um, and they're Colorado. okay, guys. They kind of suck. But yeah. They're, right. they're just terrible, terrible guys. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> but we uh, we had a day where we were like skiing with kids that had cancer. And then we had a day at some time where it was just me and him. Edwin and I were just skiing together and like talking about real life. And like I was asking about like the 90s. And like I was so into his voice as like just a singular instrument. It was inspiring to me. And I'll be was like, my daughter, one of her first songs she sang when she was like three years old, she just screamed at the top of her lungs. I just remember that being such a magical part of like, oh yeah, this was like a huge hit. And um, I saw him sing it. I was like, dude, you still, like you sang it better than I've ever heard you sing it tonight in front of all these people. And he's like, yeah, you know, it, he just made me realize that like it, it's magic. I mean, sometimes you just strike magic and you can't like, 
describe when it's coming. You, you just have to show up. And then he's been singing the same song for 30 years and knows it's magic and has, there's no bones about it. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm in. I, I love doing it. Every night I do it. I can't not do it every, <laughs> anywhere I go, you know. And it's, probably sometimes he doesn't want to do it. Oh, it's so freaking high. Can you imagine singing that every night? I'm talking oh. about just singing it all the time. Yeah. But he also, I, I bet you go through phases too where it's like songs massive. You want to play it all the time. But then you're in that middle stage where it's like, God, I don't want to play this song. I have other stuff I want to do. But then you kind of appreciate once things don't go arrow straight up, you're like, man, I really just yeah. should have loved and appreciated that lightning in a bottle. That we And I think he's there now. Yeah, he's appreciative of it. Yeah. And I follow him on TikTok. He's, he's, he's hilarious. Yeah, he just yeah. How did you guys become friends? Uh, we were, I don't know. I think we were just doing these little rounds like, so sometimes like these songwriter city people like Mike who put this all together for us will, will be like, hey, can you come do a private gig? And I met him on one of those. And uh, we just kind of like hit it off. And the next year we were supposed to do the same gig and his, his uh, I think his father died or his mother died. And we all sang I'll Be and sent a video to him. So we just kind of like, we've just kind of become buddies. For, yeah. You know, so he's coming to town. We're riding with Lee Bryce next week or a couple weeks from now. He's just That's cool. Just, and for me, I don't know, how old are you? 42. Okay, same, right? So yeah. we're same age. We heard the same music. Yeah. Influenced by the same things for the most part. We got Napster. Yeah. Right? We're that first generation yeah. that was able to grow up on tapes and CDs, and we have digital music. Like, we got to experience all that, right? And so Edwin McCain, when I first met him, I was geeking out a little bit. I'll be honest. And I'm supposed to be cool. I'm not cool. Oh, yeah. I'm not cool ever, really. But sometimes I play cool. But with him, I just couldn't be that cool because when I was a kid, I went to see him at Washtenaw Baptist University, just him and a horn player. That was the whole show. But I was such a big fan that I was probably geeking out a little too much. And he's like, why are you geeking out on me? I'm like, because you're freaking Edwin McCain. Yeah. And when you were <laughs> killing it, like that's when I was me and consuming everything. You ever get around somebody like that where you're, they're like, why are you geeking out on me? You've done so much, but you're still like, man, I'm a super fan. Oh, man. Uh, there's, there's two times I've geeked out like really hard and... Jeffrey Steele was one, and he's a songwriter. So it's not like I shouldn't be, but I just respect the songs he's done so much that when I first got an opportunity to meet him, I was like, oh, dude, I don't even want to go over there. Um, and then the other ones, like, I met John Mayer and uh, Garth Brooks. And Garth Brooks, I met him at a, an ASCAP thing. I know that's not, like, a small guy to be freaked out about, but he he was, like, really late to sound check, and we were all playing on the same show. And I'm, like, this dopey songwriter guy that, like, shouldn't be on the show anyways, but I'm playing... And he, I'm waiting for an hour, or thirty minutes till he shows up, and he doesn't show up. So I'm, I'm sitting there and like, God, we gotta, I mean, I gotta get somewhere. And we're about the show's like way behind, and he shows up and he's like, Guys, I'm so sorry, I was stuck in traffic. Um, go ahead and sound check because it's my fault. You know, I was just sitting there in traffic. So I sound checked my song, Break Up in the End, and uh, we sit there and Garth stands at like two feet away from my face and like standing on the edge of the front of the stage looking at me just like rubbing his belly just being all you know garthy and awesome and i was just like i can't i can't do <laughs> i don't know if i can do this man that dude was like everything for me growing up like my sister got tickets when when i was like 10 years old to go to garth brooks and amarillo and from a friend of hers and then at the last minute she she gave him away to her boy you know and i was like <laughs> she was gonna take me <laughs> And I literally was like crying as a little kid. So to be sitting there sound checking and Garth's like, oh, that's pretty good, you know? Yeah, Garth's awesome. Yeah, he's he was like the real deal. So and and my experiences with him have all I just keep waiting for him to, that to crack, honestly. Because he's su such a I mean, he's the biggest. Yeah. If you're just talking data, he's biggest selling American artist of all time. Yeah. He's a ten time diamond. Ten time diamond. Diamond, yeah. Like the biggest song I've ever had is like seven million or something 10 time diamond and probably records yeah so wow which is which is just i don't know no one will touch that ever probably. no because he was massive and now everything is so fractured obviously yeah. it's one song instead mm -hmm. of the album and when you talk about garth is hanging out saying I, I was late to traffic or late with the traffic we he had me come out and open uh a show razorback stadiums eight ninety thousand people hundred thousand people well, he calls for, he texts me first from a number I didn't recognize. I thought I had Garth's number. Apparently, he has like eight numbers. He has one, yeah. <laughs> Who knew? For every area code. And he's like, hey, man, <laughs> why don't you come out and open for me here? And I'm like, who is this? It was April, the day before April Fool's Day, right? And he's like, 
perfect. Yeah, it's Garth. Come open for me. It's 90,000 people are at Razorback Stadium. And I'm like, ah, shut up. Who is this? Yeah, this ain't Garth. 90,000. And then I'm just like, nah, hey, look, if this is really Garth, call me after the show. You know I'm on the air. I didn't think it was Garth. But yeah. then he freaking calls. Hey, man, it's Garth. First thing he goes, hey, you vaccinated? What? That was the first question. I'm like, yeah, I sure am. He's like, well, then here's my question. You want to come? He was, but he's just such a normal dude. It was when we were in sound check, he came out and hung out. But I didn't want, I didn't want to play. Yeah. I wanted him to get off stage. I wanted him to go away because yeah. I was embarrassed. Yeah, me too. No, you're actually good. That's the <laughs> difference. I would be like, but I was like, Garth, you should go because I don't. I want you to realize what you did by having, you yeah. know, me come out and do this. You might rethink it. If yeah, you, if you stay too long in sound check. There's Mike over here, me here. You. I think we all kind of grew up with a, um, like a a, found, a trailer foundation. I lived in either trailer parks or a trailer that was dragged to the top of a hill more times than not. Dude. So Amarillo, Texas, tell me about your upbringing, where and how you live, that kind of stuff. So my, uh, my upbringing is literally, like, ridiculous, but um, really sheltered. My dad was a preacher early on, and we lived at a, a ranch for, like, disadvantaged boys and outside of town, probably 40 miles outside of Amarillo, called uh, Cal Farley's Boys Ranch when I was— Little kid, I, might, I remember, like, being in rodeos and, like, wrestling with these, you know, wild kids and a lot of them orphans. And several hundred kids lived on this ranch. It was a working ranch. And then, you know, we just didn't have any money ever. I, I just, I remember always having, like, this like this feeling of, you know, I don't know if we'll ever make it out of this oppression that poverty is. I, I read your book, and it was I, like, cried in certain parts because I just— have blocked most of that out because you felt it probably. I, I felt that's it like when so I about hard. a song. It's like I, I felt, felt yeah. it. Yeah, I just remember, you know, you know, and, and for a while, my dad was like called to be a preacher, but then he has this family, three kids, and we have no money. He's making sixteen, seventeen grand a year, and we're living in this little flat outside of town and like forty miles away from everything. A truck that breaks down all the time, and I remember him getting a real job and moving into town. And I remember him, like, selling cars. And then he was running a car dealership for a while. And then the better his our life became, the less I had a dad. And I just remember mm. specifically at the end of his, like, you know, I was 10 years old, 9 years old, and he was working 90 hours a week to make us, to get out of that, you know? And then I learned one thing when, when he was, he went over and did, like, a mission trip to Russia when I was, like, 10, 10 11 years old. And he came back just completely changed. I remember he came back and said, you know, when they went over, they said there, there's not a lot of food in Russia. It was right before the fall of communism. It was just crazy time where, um, you know, Gorbachev was like about to have a coup come after him. But they didn't know that. They were just going over there, you know, putting suitcases full of New Testaments and covering them in T-shirts that said, you know, trying to hide them and bring them over. But they said to Dad, hey, bring some food because you're not going to have food there. You're literally wow. going to have to pack food from what we've heard. So they got over there and, and he said that he would go to these lines outside the grocery stores and it'd be like two blocks long of people trying to get in and there'd be two shelves of bread, nothing. And so when he was over there, he started, you know, giving out a Bible and they didn't really want the Bible. So he's like, well, I have food. And uh, when he came back, he had all this stuff that he traded because they were so proud. They didn't want to just take the food. So he was like, well, here's a can of peanut butter. And so one of the soldiers he was talking to took the peanut butter and went up, grabbed the Russian flag, the USSR flag, off the pole, folded it up, gave it to my dad, and said, here, I'll trade you this for the peanut butter. And then he took his hat off, and the next day another guy took his watch off. It was a USSR-issued watch. And I just remember him coming back to Amarillo. Number one, we had a great life at that point, I thought. Um, and he was just like, I can't keep doing this. I'm missing out on your life. Uh, I feel like I'm called to be a preacher, and this— the fact that you go over there and that the life is such that they would trade their flag of their country for a can of peanut butter is crazy. Um, so I just remember him at that point, like starting over and he's like, I need to quit this. Um, we lost all everything. He, and eventually we became like a preacher and we lost the house that we had, the nice car, everything. We kind of went back to square one and nothing. But I was like kind of proud of him for like, starting over in the middle of his life, which most people don't do because he was miserable and he was missing his kids' lives. And I was just like, dude, that's later on in life. I look back, I'm like, dude, that is amazing to be. He was running Don Judd Dodge at the time, working 80, 90 hours a week. And, and then he goes from that to making 20 grand and get 
we're getting shipped all around the country to California, you know, just tagging along, trying to find a little church that would allow him to preach and that kind of thing. So I think I'm here and I'm thankful for that because, you know, he showed me you can like start over at any time. And, you know, I, I we get back to Texas when I was in high school and I was like wild, you know, so I had my sweet, sweetheart girl. I have I still am hanging with her. But Crystal, I met when I was 15. And by hanging with her. I've been married. Yeah. yeah. I, by, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want everybody to know what you mean by hanging. You yeah. mean be married or Just hanging out. Yeah, yeah, just hanging. <laughs> no, we've been, we've been hanging for a while. <laughs> we were in choir together, you know. We were, like, super, super cool. We weren't, like, all-state choir nerds or anything like that. But we, I met her on this, you know, and we're back to being, like, dirt poor in Amarillo, Texas. And I'm living in, with, like, 800-square-foot house, kind of that kind of thing. But... Super happy. My parents are happy, and they're working at a church, quite a big church in town. And I fall in love with this girl in high school, and I get her pregnant. And it was crazy to me to know the right thing to do, you know, and to be this young. And then, like, you know, I've just screwed up my future. You know, I had I aced all my SATs and all this kind of stuff, so I had a lot of opportunities. And then I just saw myself just kind of wreck it all in that moment i thought you know so and my dad he's a preacher and i go into him and say i bet i got bad news you know we're pregnant and uh, i'm 15 or 16 at the time and uh, i remember him just crying and not being mad at all just being like we're here for you whatever you need just if you want to get married if you don't want to get married we don't care we're here for you guys i think you know this is going to be a massive change but I just was so enamored with the way he loved me and, you know, that it, it made me be like, oh, okay, I have to, this is an amazing dad I have. I'm so thankful for this, this dude that hasn't, because I think I would probably have been pissed, probably screamed at my kid and knocked him upside the ball cap and be like, you're, you know, I, but he just did it with such love that I was really affected by it. And then he was very proud of us. And my, we had a baby there and I was in high school and finished high school and worked like, you know, from 12 to 7, I worked at a plumbing company, and I just really scraped by and, you know, had four or five jobs before that even. But I remember specifically he got fired from the church because he was so forgiving, and we were so public about it. And I was, you know. He got fired from the church? He got fired from the church. So then it was just one of those things where I was, you know, we're sitting there. He doesn't have a job anymore. We're all living in his house. And, uh, we, he was just, you know, it was bad. It was bad. We, I mean, bankrupt, the whole thing was just all evaporated in, in front of us, and I just felt like this a massive amount of, of guilt. It was my fault because, I, you know, in that kind of Southern Baptist world that we lived in, it was just not a good situation right. for me to be this, you know, wild, you know, 16-year-old kid who liked music and Do making you, out with girls. As a dad now, I, I would have to think that that – season with your father who was very supportive at a time that was hard for everyone i would think as you get older this is just me assigning my perspective to yours that it's just you just respect it and like cherish that so much now that you understand it as an adult even more even though then you did as well but now it's got to be a whole different version of you like loving him and and I, I can't put yeah. words to it because I don't. It's it's so much emotion. Yeah, I, I would just cry. It's crazy. I'm so thankful that he reacted the way he did, and and he suffered great loss. And you know, he went on to he moved when I was 17. He moved to California. They started, and I was just emancipated and living my own life. You know, with my baby and my wife. And then years later, he told me about my granddad, and one of the reasons he was so loving towards me was you know my granddad came over from germany he was or actually poland germany and he when he was a kid his dad left he was an alcoholic his dad left and so my grandfather's mom had to give them up for adoption for a couple of years just to be able to figure out when they came back from poland she was here his dad left she couldn't work she didn't know english hardly she had to learn english and go get a job so for two years my granddad was in an orphanage with his sisters and he kind of told me that, and it made more sense to me. He's like, I don't want you mm. to be like granddad. I don't want this to end like that. I want you to, you know, it, it makes sense now, like, why he was 
so loving. And then he's, you know, he gets it. Is your dad still alive? Yeah. Yeah, oh, he's, that's awesome. He's yeah, he lives in Franklin. He was a past, He's here? Yeah, he I moved him actually, yeah, we moved him. He retired. He, he broke his back and then he's had a lot of health issues lately, so he was kind of forced into retirement. So I I found a house and I just was like, you guys come stay. I was going to have him move in with me and my wife was like, you realize we're never going to have sex again if they move in. So. <laughs> So we, we made alternate arrangements <laughs> you and your very wife. quickly. And I'm thankful for that because yeah. I think it's very healthy for someone who's been married for as long as we have that we still even do stuff like that. It's crazy. You and your wife have been married for, if that's the case, how long? 25 years. I got a 25-year-old daughter. So, Okay, that's, that's pretty uh, fun. That's, yeah, pretty that, fun. That's, I say that's wild, but my mom was 15 when she hit Yeah. You know? Yeah. But when I think back as that as a kid, she wasn't young because she's, my mom and she's older. Yeah. But then when I get older, and I'm like, that would be like you would have like a 20 year old right now, or, you know? Or, no, yeah, no, I would have the same as you're. Yeah, yeah. you have 26. I'd have a 20. Yes, my my wife's 31. So, I, man, that's and it's weird. It's weird. My uh, my daughter's boyfriend's 30. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> this is messed up. Something is like I feel wrong. I feel old and young at the same time. That's What's wrong crazy. with me? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you move here at 18. Yeah. You're, you're, you have a baby and a wife. Yes. When did you get married, by the way? How old were you? Um, we had to sign it off. Like, my dad had to sign me to get married at 17. Okay, so when you're... Right before we left. Really? Or 16, yeah. Does he do that? Is that part of the emancipation pro- uh, yeah. uh, process? Not proclamation <laughs> yeah, process? When, when we go to get married, he has to be there and literally, like, so make sure. Otherwise, it might have been, like, technically, like, my wife's much older than me. She's, like, eight months older. So it might have been a little legal trouble, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're 18 and you move here. Why? Why? I mean, yeah, exactly. If I'd have known how hard it was, I wouldn't have. But um, I just told her, I was like, we're, we're already destitute poor. We were looking at houses that were like, I was working at a plumbing company. And there was a house that was like 20 grand in the ghetto in, that, in Amarillo. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. This is my life. I can see my whole life here. This is me. I'll be a plumber. I'll make, you know, 14 bucks an hour. And, you know, that'll be our life. But... If we go to Nashville, at least we, maybe we could do something we enjoy doing. That was all. That was my, I want to do something in a musical world that I enjoy doing. What were you enjoying doing musical, though, in Amarillo? Like, what were you already doing at 17 where you thought maybe I could find something I like? I don't know. I mean, my, my family's really good, at, like, way better than me at music stuff. So Did you play were, in church or sing in church? They, yeah, from, like, five. They would have me singing, like, harmonies. And, and did you take to harmony. it pretty easy? Did you under... Uh, oh, yeah. It was super easy for me. Did you play guitar, piano, young? I played violin because that, that's wow. what they needed in the family band, I think, or something. I don't remember. But And if you can play a violin, can't you pretty much play anything? Yeah, I'm not good at violin, but I, I, was, uh, I could play guitar pretty well and piano. I was just, I would always, my mom had a great, she was a great pianist, so I'd fool around on, like, an old piano she had. And Did you know that you could make money in Nashville other than being a singer? Like, what did you know at eight? I just think of me at 18. I didn't even know songwriting I, was a thing. I did not know. I just knew that I applied to Belmont on, like, this crazy whim. And I was like, well, I can go to college there. And then maybe I can do something like accounting and behind the scenes in music or, mm, like, got sell T-shirts on the road. Or I, I really didn't know. I didn't know the songwriting was a thing. I had no idea. Like, I thought Dominaria when I was a kid. I was like, these guys are geniuses. This is all their songs. They, they are come so up with good. All this. Yeah. yeah. And Garth the same way. I didn't realize it was that was like a profession at all. I never even like. When did that happen though? Where you did learn that was a profession? That you oh, shortly after moving here, I was like, okay, this is this could happen. There were several people. I was like lucky to be in Josh Turner's class early on, and I saw him get a record deal when he was like twenty something, you know. And I, I was like, okay, so you and he was writing songs with other people, and a lot of people were getting publishing deals where they're making like thirty grand a year. I was like, this is amazing. But how do you even get in a class? So you move here, you're 18. And I know my class, It's Dan, it, we all got here at the same time doing different things. But Dan, Shay, before they were Dan and Shay, right? I knew those guys. And yeah. So, but there's a whole group of us that came in and we were all just like, what the heck is, what do we do here? What do we do now? We're in Nashville doing different things. Yeah. But we came at the same time. And that's what I really remember about moving here. These other people that had just kind of started too. And... But I knew what I, when I got here, I was already an adult, but I knew what I was doing. If you're 18 or so and you just moved to town, one, do you find a house or an apartment? And then where do you start? I, we had a, it's a long story, but 
when I was moving here, I, I was at the last minute was not going to come to Nashville at all. I was just going to stay in Texas. And a friend of mine who was going to Vanderbilt, which luckily he was a friend here and he kind of scattered this place out. I told him I couldn't afford to go to Belmont because I got like, I think I had 2000 bucks a year I needed or something like that. And uh, I th- it was pretty much full scholarship because I got lucky on my SATs and then I sang for him and they were like, yeah, you were in choir. You can, you can have a vocal scholarship. So, you know, I came here and I was like, I can't do it. I tried, I looked at it and I was looking at all the figures and I was like, this is crazy. I can't do this. So his dad called me and said, what do you need? There's a check waiting. Just come by and get it. Whatever it is, I don't care how much it is. I was, and th- at the time I was making six bucks an hour. I was like, it's thousands of dollars a year. You don't understand. And he's like, I don't care. Just come by. And he's the only reason I'm here. So when I got here, I had that one friend, you know, in Vanderbilt world. And then I quickly was just immersed in the music classes I was taking. And those so the classes, class at school. Yes. I thought you meant like the class because that no. was like a class. You, a literal class. Literally in so my. So you were at, Josh Turner was in class with you? He was in my vocal seminar, yeah. There were four people in that thing that ended up getting, quitting school and getting like, you know, publishing deals or whatnot. It's a couple of Christian artists. And Before the mics came on, you were like, yeah, somebody's in my class who sucked and got a record deal. That was Josh Turner. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say that. I'm just kidding. Dude. I'm just kidding. I'm, you know what? He could make it rumble the seats. There was not like a dry seat in the whole room at that time. It was just like so amazing, his big voice. And then I would get up there and I'm like all raspy and tinny. And, so that's how uh, you create a music community. Literal school. That was for me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you see people doing it. Which yep. then tells you that you can do it. Yeah, and then I, I thought it would just be easy. I like they gave us these opportunities to try out to be on records for. I was on a record for Glenn Campbell when I was a little kid, like eighteen or nineteen. I show up to the studio and I have no idea what I'm doing. There, there's pizza there, and I was like, "Oh, this is amazing!" the The little record was like a Christmas record and got a Grammy nomination. I'm nineteen. I'm like, I'm Grammy nominated. You know, this is the easiest ever. But um, I never got. Further than that, because I was working at Sears and working at, you know, apartment complexes and getting fired from jobs. And my wife was running, she was throwing drinks down a bar in, in Antioch. And so I never was able to expand on that and go and, like, get a publishing deal immediately. So when I got out of school, it was, I was, did one internship for Zomba Music and it was about to close down. So I just, I bailed and I was like, I quit for years. Did, did you want to, did you want to sing, though? Because I, your, your voice is so soulful. And I'm sure that you get compared vocally to a lot of people. Like, this, I, I, I don't know I'm, if you're going to be, I think it's a good compl- uh, compliment or an insult. Like, when you sing, because I've heard you sing, uh, like uh, Daryl Hall, like that, that tone, that soulfulness yeah. that kind of doesn't match, but it does. So it's awesome. Yeah. Like, I feel that from you a little bit. And so, because you could do that, is that what you wanted to do? I, was very, I was honestly grateful to even be in Nashville. I didn't care. I was never, there never was a moment where I was like, really, I want to be a star. Because I knew that I had screwed up so many times in so many ways that just to be able to do this, I was like, oh my God, I'm I'm thankful to be able to write songs for other people and let other people. And I've got such anxiety. I can't imagine. I did like a Chase Rice deal where I opened up for Chase for a whole season and it was, um, I was mortified to go out in front of like 5,000, 6,000 people every night. But not really. You're being, oh, no. you're being humble here. No. I was like trembling. My hands were just like trembling behind them. And then I would get out and it'd be fine and I'd, it would go well and, you know. But. I just have a hard time having heard you sing. And I, I hope you think that the Daryl Hall reference is, oh, I'm, feels. It's you know, amazing. Yeah. Ha- having heard you sing at like rounds and. Yeah. That you would go out and be, and mental health has nothing to do with the reality of it. Yeah. It really does. I mean. No, it's you, different. But still, when you see someone that's so good, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm scared to go do what I'm really good at. I just wish I had something I was good at. And I'm just like, <laughs> what? How can you be good at it and be scared to do it? And I'm over here. I'm a Swiss Army knife, half dull, trying to find anything to do. Dude. Uh, where, where does that anxiety come from? Were you an anxious kid? or? Oh, yeah. I was like massively obese as a little kid i was like 150 pounds in fourth grade so I'd, i had these all these struggles that i was just like coping with that until i was an adult and then i was you know i'm still struggling with it and trying to keep healthy all the time and working out like crazy because my metabolism is just zero but that's not really that you know when i my first publishing deal i turned in 10 songs they took it to the record labels and all the record labels said no 
And a lot of them said no because I, had, I was 25 and I had no hair. I shaved my head. So I just thought, well, God doesn't want me to do this. And I, I was really, it was easy for me to be like, okay, I'm a songwriter. And that mm-hmm. I, was, I was never meant to be that. And I was pretty at peace with that. And every time these things come up, like uh, the head of Ca- Capitol a couple of years ago was like, you should do a record. I would love to do a record. And I, was, I thought I was joking because we were at a bar. And I was like, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, someday, we'll, yeah, that's great. But I just don't know that my soul is meant to do that. Do you I, think, though, if you'd have had, and this is both a compliment and a question, but again, I'm going to say it one final time. I th- you're such a good singer. Your, your vocals are, are, the texture is a little different. It's, it's awesome. If you would have gotten a bit of positive feedback, just a bit. I probably would have done it, yeah. So a lot of that is based on what you felt the reality was off a of few. Do you wish you would have pushed through that situation looking back? Um, you know, I think I'm a big fan of like the gold, you know, rush era where they have like Parker Schnabel up on gold rush, Alaska and that TV show. And like all the guys from, I, I read a lot about just weird stuff, but like in San Francisco, all the people that made all the money were not the people that were the ones holding the nugget in their hand, at the, you know, in the river. They were the people that were selling them shovels and they were the people that were their auxiliary. Um, and they weren't digging in the ditches. They were home at night, sleeping in the bed with their, you know, beautiful wife and having their families. And the other people were out there on the mountain digging and, and losing sleep and, like, coming up bloody. But they had the nugget. But the other people made it possible for that's a, these that's stars a great to a, do their thing. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an awesome analogy because I was like, yeah, that's stupid. But no, now that makes all the sense in the world. So I'm, I help... I help people to be stars, and that's awesome. Do you want I to be love famous? Do you want, would you want to be famous? No. You answered that so quickly. I'm no. asking again. Oh, yeah, no, dude. I'm telling you. you don't the only be- way I would, if I could be like Stapleton famous, where it's like do your own thing, not really have to fit into this. Any, You just kind of whatever your soul, mm-hmm. follow the sail that your you know, wind blows and do your thing. Yeah, I, that's cool. But I, other than that, I like going to Target and nobody knowing, nobody caring. It's fun. So when you play a show if you're playing let's say you're playing a writer's round and you're playing your songs i mean are you getting a fulfillment from that yeah it's fun it's a high is it to tell your it's verse? about as high as it's it's almost as high as writing a great song but it's like right below it it is below it though. yeah even with like five thousand people it's pretty cool you've convinced me i didn't believe it at first but you've yeah. convinced me it's but, good dude it's a good life oh i'm not disagreeing with you i've just, I, I know what the songs you've written <laughs> <laughs> I know the last. You're doing pretty good. Yeah, it's all right. Um, you have, you have any number twos? I have a number. I have several number twos. I think um, one of them that hurt a little bit was with uh, Chase Rice. I think it was called "Gonna Wanna Tonight," and I had uh, another song that was on the chart that was the "Strip It Down" song for Luke Bryan. Mm-hmm. And I pro- I didn't know how things work behind the scenes, but I think had I been smart i'd be like called somebody on luke's camp and be like i have the next one up but it just sat there and knocked it down so and i've had several that didn't go all the way i had like you know it's a pretty good problem though i have the next one up dude I, it's unbelievable it's unbelievable i have one right now that i don't know what's gonna happen with the gabby song that i love so much oh it's gonna do great okay yeah it's gonna be great you just never you never know and and it's i don't really know either because i don't really do anything with the programming side of it but our show has such a big imprint that i can play something and i can see the difference and also my management is gabby's management we're like oh i gotcha we're <laughs> gabby and i work together on american idol you know yeah. but i hope was a uh, that was a you deal oh yeah that thing it's crazy golly that was it nuts. was crazy like it just from my world it was crazy twice and i tell you there are only a few songs that i ever hear the first time and go oh i didn't expect that that's awesome and it's catchy as crap and that was one of those songs because i was just flipping Maybe I was on satellite or on the radio. I don't know, but I hear, I hope, yeah, I hope he does all this. I hope he good stuff. And I'm like, all right. Oh, yeah, yeah, good. This is, oh, good look, Gabby. I've been on Gabby forever. Good for her. Good. Let's see what this does. I hope. And then I hope he cheats. Oh, holy crap. I was. N- I did not expect that. <laughs> it's so funny. So it's only one of the few that that's happened where I'm like, that is fresh. And so I want to talk about this version of the song before I talk about it going over to pop. And... Charlie did to it, but who is it? Who who did you write that with? So it was Gabby, Zach Kale, and me on like the day before Halloween or Halloween. But I had Zach, Zach was I was trying to get him to sign over at Sony, 
I was trying to like somehow big brother him and be part of his life and like help him and advise him. So I had him over and that's how I found about Gabby. He w- he was at church with her or something like singing. He had on his phones her singing like a sound check at church. And that's how I heard her voice. I didn't hear it on American Idol. I was just that he was at my house mm. eating dinner. He was like, check this girl out. She's amazing. And I was like, that is a great. She's like, I thought she was a black girl. She had mm. so much soul. I was like, wow, this is insane. So I said, let's write with her one afternoon. And that then, was it. That's how it was. That's how it that's wasn't how somebody about. from like the. No. Because I, because again, my management team went and like got her rec, got, gotten shopped, like yeah. did the thing. Oh, yeah. And even think, when she was living in Pittsburgh, like I was doing a stand up show in Pittsburgh and her and her sister and her dad, they all came to the show. Yeah. And I was like, Gabby, you do, you have to move to Nashville. And I think on this show, I told her that before she moved down you here. Did. Yeah. I was, she was like, I don't have to. In her, like she's from <laughs> Pittsburgh, but she still does a, like an effect. On her voice, She's like I don't have to move down there. Like Luke says, I'm like, no, no, you, I don't have to. Yeah, you have to, Gabby. <laughs> and then she moves down, and you see a video of all things, and that's how she gets in a room with you. Yeah, it's weird. I was asking him what artists. I was like, Zach, what artists are like? What do you love? Because I don't know of any new stuff that I really am excited about. We should just find something you love and and like dive in and like really embrace it. And the first song we wrote was I hope. And it was me and him, and Zach's, like, our age. He's, like, a dude, you know, yeah. he's got kids. And so I'm sitting over here looking, like, me and you and Gabby, who's 12 at the time or 18 yeah. or something, you know, like, two old dudes and Gabby. And we're, like, talking, let's write I Will Always Love You. We're, like, something. She has such an amazing voice. Let's just, like, you know, acting like she's not in the room. She's, like, uh, boys, we're well, girls are not that nice. Can we, like, not do that much lovey-dovey thing, you know? And that's how... The impetus from the first, you know, handful of lines that we had, we kept them, and then we just flipped it and made it the chorus so that we were like, oh, yeah, we're writing all these nice things. Let's just keep them nice all the way till the end, and then we just stumbled into it, and I hope he cheats, you know? Whenever that comes out, whomever, do you guys go, oh, my God, that's it? Yeah. Or do you go, I don't know, it's so weird, so different. You knew. I was so, like... I was like, I know in my gut that girls will scream this at the top of their lungs and, like, throw their water bottles out the window. They're so mad at an ex. I was like so, and I was, I just saw it. I never know. I didn't know about whatever she's got. I don't know any, any of the other, half of the other songs, I didn't know about We Were Us or any of those other songs, like, when they were done, I wasn't like, this is it. But that one, we got done, and we're like, the Sony... Uh, right of rooms there was like a pool table we we're like hanging out by the pool table afterwards and and zach was like this is pretty good and gabby's like i know and i was like no this one's like this is not pretty good this is like one of the best songs i've ever written i'm telling you this i don't know how i know i just felt it and they were laughing and like yeah, yeah. i was like oh i'm not joking because i just had gotten a number one for uh, breakup in the end like right when we wrote this and so they were they were like yeah i'm sure whatever and then I, I was behind the scenes, like, calling everybody. I called Ross Copperman. I called everybody, Tom Lord. Just don't let this one die. Don't, like, let it fizzle and go away, And you know. So I was right, but it wasn't, like, I really. you never know. I really didn't know, but I just, my gut was, like, screaming at me. Mm-hmm. You better say something. It just felt different. It felt, yeah. Different, yeah. And so Tom Lord's my manager. Oh, gotcha, yeah. Right, so, so he has Gabby, and I remember... I just hearing it and I was like, wow. And, so, and I texted him and I was like, yo, because I, I have nothing to do with picking songs right. for the most part. I'm like, yo, that, like, that's it. It's brutal. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> but that's it. That song, like, that's it. Oh. And he was like, I hope, you know. And then he's okay, so funny. I hope. Yeah. yeah he's, like, <laughs> he's like, you never know. I hope. And so the song, yeah, you got to give him credit. He ran up the flagpole with that thing. He ran up the flagpole <laughs> with her and then ran up with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, dude, you're forgetting about me. Like, let's <laughs> chill out. Yo, I'm I, I'm in Costa Rica here, man. Come come down and visit me on set or something. Yeah. Um. So, then, I hear the Charlie Puth version, and all I remember thinking is I heard or like ah, like a run at the beginning. And I was like, wait, that's not on this song. And so I hear it, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I asked somebody. I don't know who told me this, and you can tell me if it's true or false. I believe it's true, even if you say false. And I'm not even supposed to know if I should share this. I don't have a filter, so I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, and and this could be partially off, or maybe this story's been discussed in public. But from what I know, Charlie just messaged Gabby and was like, hey, that song's awesome. Can you send me 
like some uh, the stems. Yep. That was it. That's it. And DM. Then, yeah. And then she they she did, but didn't really know what was. Yeah. And then he just sent it back and was they, like, they, "I did this." She asked Zach and I, and was like, "Should I do this?" And we said, "It's Charlie Puth." Yes. I mean, yes. Amazing. And do stems. It. Uh, let me. Like uh, all the tracks behind yeah. the musical with stuff. no vocals. And yeah. what's funny about that song is those stems ended up being what um, Zach and our, a couple of our buddies did that day for the demo. They just a lot of those just got passed over, and Ra, uh, like Ross took those and added bass and drums and stuff. Like it, her vocal from that record was the demo vocal. Really, it was literally one or two takes of that demo. That's how good she was on that day. And I didn't really realize how powerful her voice was because I had to go trick or treating with my little man, so I didn't hear the whole vocal until I just got it, you know. And I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is insane!" So when you get the Charlie version. It's crazy. I didn't even know if it made sense at first. I was like, does this make sense? This is amazing. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> and did you wonder if you, because I get it. You're like, does this make sense? Do I love it so much because it sounds good, but does it also yeah. still make sense? Yeah. As a, as a yeah. entity. Like the yeah. story. Yeah. It, it, so that, again, it's, it like was allowed to breathe a new, bigger life because it became a monster pop song yeah. too. Yeah. And you guys didn't have anything. because. Again, he just sent it back, right? It was like, hey, this is it. I hope you yeah. like it. Yes. That's it was, so crazy. And what's crazy, in those situations, like, Nashville's a different place for the artists. If, if they change a line, if they do stuff to the song, they're very kind about it, typically. They know the writers don't have any touring income, and they're, you know, our life is whatever the song is. And a lot of times in L.A., that's different. They, they will take a large portion of the song. Um, and I fully expected... A, a name like that who just had a big, huge couple number one, worldwide number ones to take a big part. He was so completely fair in like what he asked for on the song that I was like shocked. I was shocked. And I said that, yeah, that's great. No question. Don't even negotiate. Do it. Because he's adding so much interest to it that it, it makes it so fun for me to be part of, you know? I think we all grew up listening to country and pop and like mm -hmm. hip hop and everything. So... It didn't really like rub me wrong to have him on there. It was awesome. I was like, oh, another another cool like avenue for this song. To Agree. Like. I never felt weird about it. No, because it was cool. Gabby also could do both while not losing her integrity. Yeah, because she naturally is that when yeah. she sings, and so that I guess I never even thought about that because there are some songs, you know, whenever. Uh, George Jones put Snoop Dogg on a record. Now I'm just saying this to uh, not. Not really. Is that a record? No, but oh, just that'd be amazing. Just not really to uh, Give a point the finger at anybody. But when somebody really, and then they put on a hip hop artist, and it doesn't make sense. You're like, I get what you're where you're trying to go, yeah. but it doesn't really work. But with Gabby, that works because you her integrity is she could kind of straddle that line. Yeah, like Carrie, and not, not to not to compare them because they're both blonde big singers, but Carrie could do the same thing and did the same thing for so long. Yeah, that we believed it. And she did pop and country because it was true. And it makes her audience, you know, maybe it pulls a lot of her audience into that world that are that artists. But I, I think more than anything, people discovered Gabby because, oh, Charlie, I know Charlie. What's Gabby? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. This is amazing. So I think it helped, helped both of them, honestly. You know what song I like is... Uh, she got the mood, uh, uh, whatever she's David got. David Neal, uh, yeah. Yeah, whatever she's got, right? Yeah. That's what. That's fun. That one, that's a really good song. It was fun. That was a. That's a long time ago. Yeah, like nine, eight or nine, ten years ago even. Was, was that one of your first number ones? That was like, maybe, that was the second number one, but it, we wrote it first. Mm -hmm. We wrote it like it was before. I had uh, Tip It On Back for Dirks, and then I had like a song really like, earlier called glass for thompson square but whatever she's got was the one where everybody was like okay like yeah that luke, song's awesome luke called me and was like can you, you want to write i like this david nail song can we write some songs mm. you so know? people other artists heard it yes and, it opened my every door open from that song all of the keith stuff you know was partially because of that keith actually was going to cut that song and i think he put a vocal on that song but then it, it just didn't feel like his project he was doing at the time and they were all working together in the same, and David Nail was on the same record label, and thank God David cut it, and 
sings it higher than anyone ever human. That song should. is still awesome. Yeah, it feels like brand new. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Uh, when you talk about Keith, I just want to talk about choruses, but I want to, a couple of the, the Keith, well, the one for sure is the, um, when the time was possible, uh, Miranda, Keith and Miranda, we were us. Oh, was it something? Oh, yeah. that's, yeah. Yeah. I, we were I'm us. Straight melody here. Oh, it's a balls of balls. Yeah. <laughs> or lack of melody for me. No, it's, no. I'm nailing it. I'm nailing it. Give me a break. Uh, what's, what's the key in your mind to a chorus working melodically? Because there, you guys, uh, there's some strong ones. It just depends. Like, most of it is like what mood I'm in that day. But I, I'm always. That song was all about the feeling and the up tempo. And, and we tried to write that song in the morning with uh, Thomas Rhett. Me and Jimmy, like, played him a little thing with just two lines from that chorus. And he was having, like, his day was not going well. He got a call from his label. It was like hell, hellacious. So we wrote a different song or half of a different song that day. We were like four half songs, and then he was like, I got to go. So in the afternoon, Nicole came in, and we wrote that little chorus to finish that out, and, and she's like, well, I would love to do this as a duet. I've had people asking for duets. and So a lot of it was Nicole and I come from similar backgrounds. She's like from the middle of nowhere. I'm from yeah, the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So we are just like, let's talk about our towns but not put anything in between them. And so that melody, I think, is almost a non-melody. It's like a couple of notes that are just so in that – the tension of the pulling on the different, you know, it's all about tension for me. The chord's major, and then there'll be a little bit of tension because there'll be one that's right out of the chord and it pulls back down the whole time. And that kind of, like, mentally feels, like, catchy. Um, and then there's melodies like, uh, you know, Break Up in the End, that chorus melody is very high and very, like, starts low and goes crazy high. You know, and I, I've always liked, like, Somewhere Over the Rainbow and songs with actual crazy melodies um, but those are not in our genre all that as common because it's so lyrically heavy and lyrically driven. You can't fit as many lyrics in those kind of melodies a lot of times. So, um, you write melody, for, not all the time, universally. But do you prefer to, or does it come to you melody first or lyrics first? Just those two. We we'll keep story. Just melody or lyrics first. First. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's not an answer. No, I think um, most of the time it's it's. Uh, it's lyric for me. I'm, I'm very much... Do you keep lyrics in your phone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like never-ending. All day. It's annoying, actually. Every movie, every single TV show, every time I talk to anybody, it's just like a annoying habit. Sponge. My, my parents think that I'm like a jerk sometimes because I'll be on my phone and I'll be literally like writing down things they've said. And uh, <laughs> they're like, you should probably get off your phone sometime. I'm like, I'm, I, I, I'm working. <laughs> I do that too, but I'm just on Twitter. I tell my wife I'm writing songs. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's exactly the opposite. That, yeah. yeah. Uh, you I'm mentioned, actually looking at electric cars. No, you mentioned two, just talking to two people that I really think are good and admire professionally. Also, am with a bit socially is Nicole Gallion, Ross Copperman, both. Yeah, and have you worked with both of them a lot? Yes, they were very early on. We like, like you have your buddies, your class, you mm-hmm. Dan and Shay. You, you know, that's my first one of my first co-writes after getting a deal was Nicole. Uh, and she was like, I don't even know if I can do this. And she was an assistant to some manager. And, you know, we've known each other a long time. And then Ross, maybe the third or fourth co-write in town, you know, that he was in town. I was you guys 10 get, years before that. But, st- do you guys still write together? Yes, all the time. Really? Yeah. I wrote with Ross, Ross and Brett Young yesterday. And Nicole and I wrote, you know, probably once a month, you know. So I've never actually revealed this, but I can. And this won't be the, I mean, I, well, who cares? So, so you made out with Ross? Or, oh, I, I'm kidding. No, it was just Ross. Yeah, not Nicole. <laughs> Nicole filmed. Oh, yeah. It was, it was a good one, though. So this is where you came up in my life, and it probably never got to you. But a few years ago, maybe four, because the pandemic's kind of yeah, we count, shaped. We deduct two years from life. Yeah, it's tough. But maybe four years ago, I was talking with Ross, and I said, hey, I have this idea. I was watching the news, or I was watching like 60 Minutes, or one of those news-type shows that goes on. And in Japan, they have this hologram that was a pop star. Uh huh. And like a dead pop star. Nope. Live. Okay. Created. She never existed, but it was a hologram of a character that was also a pop star. Perfect. And she was selling tickets to these shows. And so I go to Ross and I say, hey, man, I watched this story 
why could we not do this? But here's 10 openers on 10 different tours. It's a hologram. Like, how? <laughs> so to him, like as a kind of a business idea, I say, and there's a hologram now. I say, this business model doesn't cost much to do. I mean, no. I have no idea how to make a hologram. It can be a cartoon in my mind. It doesn't matter. Yes. We can have this fictional cartoon, not real human. We can have it have a hit, but we can send it on tour with 10 people at the same time as the baby Amazing. act. And you just need a couple people to run it. All good. And he's like, Ross, you sing it. Whomever. I just, yeah. At the Wait, time, just it's just some. like, it's just like, let's, and Ross is like, oh, you know, Ross. I know. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, it's like a money machine. You just yes. pull the handle and, and Ross like, oh, no, oh, no. oh, what do we do? And I'm uh, like, well, let me have some time on this. And I'm just thinking, how do we make oh. this work? And I go, okay, well, if we have some songs. I know the people that can do the visuals. But somehow we've got to make the product really good to make everything else work. Yeah. The songs, you have to have hits. It's like anything. If you yeah. don't have the song, you have it's to do like nothing. It's like Millie Vanilli digitally. Got to have the song, yeah, though. Got to have, have good songs. Great. That's a great hit. You so know? I say to Ross, let's just go, let's just write some songs and not say anything about it. And we'll create this, this group, but they'll never know our identity. This terrible. This is terrible. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, who, do we, who should we do this with? Oh, dude. And he says, okay, I got a couple ideas. And he says, Nicole and you. Oh yeah, because super, super just, no band. He just lo he lo <laughs> loved what loved you, loved what you did, and uh, he was like, "Well, we shouldn't do it with a big group because somebody will tell." Because we all sign NDAs. Oh wow! And he goes, "We need a girl." And he goes, and they're both excellent, awesome. He goes, "Let's talk to Nicole, and maybe we bring John if Nicole wants to do it or doesn't." We didn't, we didn't have a plan, so we called Nicole. Yeah, and she's I would have like, called her first too. And she's like, "I'm in." Yeah. So we spent. <laughs> months no way this is not real this is real this really happened huh i'm this is i'm learning we didn't this. talk about I, i've never revealed this, this is before. amazing and nicole i t i took nicole to perform on i was hosting the today show for a week and so i took her up to perform on the show i was like come up and perform they'd let me bring in whoever i want and so i said hey i'm gonna bring up the neon people stuff oh, it's called neon people oh my gosh I, i've never said that it feels like i'm saying a bad word i i think i heard this in the backwoods of alabama driving down to the beach one time you probably did and i texted her and she denied it was her we couldn't we couldn't say anything about it i was like i know you this is you i heard it me and my wife were jamming it loud so that's neon people we wrote these songs what the heck? and we were just about to and i remember we were just about to call you too we'd written like 34 and cut them and we were, and then nicole got the running that label yeah. and she was like i can't do this anymore and we're like <laughs> no we just spent all these months writing all these songs. We would go to Ross's house. Now you know what you know, it's like to be a songwriter. Oh, my God. You spend months and you have no hit. <laughs> it's like, I wrote we, 300 songs for this. It's great. We record it. We put them out. They're on They're on uh, streaming services, Spotify. They have hundreds of thousands of listens. No way. Oh, my so, gosh. So, but you, yeah, th my point is. I'm so close with it. Neither one of them has ever told me I've about I've never this. said anything about it either. I spend hours across from them on a weekly basis, and no one's ever said anything. That's un that's a good NDA. So, that's and like we just wanted it, ironclad. the integrity of it. We wanted it to, nobody to know, because we wanted to put out these songs that were super positive. Can and I see what the hologram I'm, looked like? Well, least? I'm going to show you. I'm pulling it up here. So it was neon PPL. We we had the whole thing. And so, oh, I guess they've changed the background on it. But, mm, well, there's no hologram here. But that was that was the, the, the deal. Like, One Little Town's got 340,000 views. Wow. And it was all to be anonymous and put out positive. And then, create the, then create the hologram and make much money. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, but, yeah, that's where you came up. Dude, that's my time. kind of artistry right there. We didn't want anybody to know it was us. I can still raise my babies. You know, I cannot have to get on a... Yeah, but it, but it was But it was you. You were almost in this wow. failed venture. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you for saving me three months of my life writing songs that no one heard. That's amazing. But you, or three hundred thousand people heard those uh, so. for that one. Yeah, but if you Dude. heard Nicole singing on something, that was it. That was it. I texted her. She bl she blatantly non lied, but she didn't really acknowledge it. She would not say that it was her. And and it's we crazy. we did it, and we are not selling holograms anywhere. And, yeah. But it was a fun experiment. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I like going to a show and then somebody like messing up and like 
It feels real. We're we gonna have the hologram messed up too, though. Yeah. It was part of the plan. Oh, really? Yeah. Like gonna be, she was gonna be like, down. "Oh, I played the wrong chord. I'm sorry." It'd be cool if yeah. the hologram just falls off the stage mm -hmm. and all of it. We're we gonna amazing. take all the bloopers. Look, oh. you're you're extremely successful in, in many ways. You're inspiring, but not quite on the neon people train. <laughs> you know, you could still write some songs for us. We can I'm see. in. I'm in. Um, you guys follow J Knight Rider, J N I T E Rider on Instagram. Um, in the intro we did for you, we talked about a lot of your songs. So oh, man, I appreciate uh, that's all there. And right now, the, your other Gabby songs on the chart. Yeah, we talked about a minute ago, and and I told you I feel good about it. I, so I, I asked that: Are you in the Gabby camp now? I I think so. Yeah, like who she yeah. trusts, and when it's like, yeah, we need to focus with people that I believe in. She calls you. She definitely is like very thankful that we were you know, believers and you know early and. You know, she asked me about getting married early, you know, like stuff like that you would ask, you know, an uncle or a buddy. You yeah, know? So that's awesome, man. She's, she's sweet. Well, I've really enjoyed this. I would have enjoyed I it too. more if we'd have been in Neon People together. <laughs> but it is, it is what it is. It's Re never too late. There's yeah. no, you know. It is. It what is now because the the there are no rules. It's like it's, pop. It's There are no rules. It's open. Uh, it's funny. Dude, good to talk to you. Congratulations on everything. Thanks for inspiring everybody. Oh, I didn't do crap. real, yeah, man. Same, same for you, man. It's uh, really cool to have you up here and... You know, I gotta I, tell you, that's a pretty cool looking headshot you have there. I, I took it on an iPhone. You did? Yeah. <laughs> you do photography? No. Oh, all right, never mind. All right, John Knight, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>